When you hear the word realism, what do you think of? The world of art genres and subgenres can get very pretentious and confusing, so I'll try to make this as simple as possible. American neorealism is probably my favorite film genre. But thanks to Walt Disney and Ronald Reagan, we don't even know what it is. Recently, there's been a trend to label filmmaker Sean Baker as America's leading neorealist, but I find that to be a little inaccurate. In 1944, the Italian film industry was virtually non-existent. 20 years of living under fascist rule may stifle creativity, but just two months after Nazis abandoned their occupation of Rome, Italian filmmaker Roberto Rossellini began filming Rome Open City. Since the local film studios had been damaged in the war and were converted into temporary housing, Rossellini had to resort to filming almost entirely on location. He had to utilize different types of black market film and cast almost exclusively non-professional actors. The citizens of Rome were now reenacting what they had just recently endured two months prior, and it resulted in a very different and dark cinematic experience, one the citizens of Rome didn't find entertaining when released just a year later. Up until this point, almost every film since the dawn of narrative filmmaking was an escape fantasy that focused on storytelling and entertainment, but Rossellini had set the stage for a movement that would soon be known as Italian neorealism, the most well-known film of which being Bicycle Thieves, released in 1948 about a poor man and his son's search for their stolen bicycle, which is necessary for the father's job. Italian neorealism had a profound influence on filmmakers all across Europe, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, with the use of non-professional actors filming on location and telling stories that were relatable, relevant, and realistic. These films have become so influential they almost resemble modern cinema more so than they do films released just a few years earlier. But neorealism never truly took off in America. While it certainly was influential, and there are a few dozen films from the era that are considered neorealist in approach, the genre itself was never truly defined. Ultimately, it wasn't until the independent filmmakers of the 90s that neorealism's influence and explorations of poverty as a genuine subject were widely embraced in American cinema. But why is that? Was America just obsessed with more western cowboy hero movies? Was it because we won the war? Or was it because American filmmakers simply weren't interested? <laughs> The Hollywood blacklist was a period from the late 40s to 1960s when many people in the film industry were accused of being communists and were subsequently banned from working in Hollywood. The blacklist had a chilling effect on free speech and political dissent, as well as devastating consequences for the careers of those involved and even some of their past co-stars. The blacklisting began as a result of an investigation by the HUAC into alleged communist infiltration of Hollywood, fueled by fears of communist influence in the wake of World War II. During the investigations, hundreds of people in the entertainment industry were called to testify, and many were forced to identify others whom they suspected of being communist. Those who refused to cooperate or were deemed unsatisfactory in their answers were blacklisted, and a few even faced up to a year in jail. Two of the most notable supporters of the blacklist were Walt Disney and then Screen Actors Guild President Ronald Reagan, both of which testified to Congress in support of the blacklist and whose testimonies were used as evidence against their colleagues. Reagan had become an informant for the FBI and provided them with a list of names that he thought were communist. In front of Congress, Reagan was a little more hesitant and made it clear that he didn't believe the Communist Party should be outlawed if it was a legitimate political party. But the fight against communism would soon become Reagan's first political passion. Walt Disney, on the other hand, got in front of Congress and accused many former employees of being communist. Their crime? trying to unionize. The blacklist had a lasting impact on the culture of Hollywood and the United States as a whole. Filmmakers weren't producing neorealist films because they couldn't out of fear of having their lives ruined if they intertwined with neorealist subject matter. But by the late 80s, neorealism's influence on American cinema was undeniable, with films like Jim Jaramusch's Stranger Than Paradise and Down By Law. And by the early 90s, America's revival of neorealism was so prevalent, it's a defining characteristic of the independent film movement. But unlike Italy, America wasn't coming out of a devastating war in the 90s. The socio-political landscape was very different, with filmmakers like Richard Linklater and Kevin Smith focusing on the everyday life and boredom of suburban America. Wanna come to this party with me tonight? There's gonna be some pussy there, man. With you? 
don't think so. Oh, look at you. I don't hang out with drug dealers. Harmony Corinne focusing on the lives of impoverished and marginalized individuals, but doing so with a more experimental and stylistic approach. And filmmakers like Spike Lee, Jim Jaramouche, and the Hughes brothers focusing on the effects of poverty in an urban environment, with the latter intertwining with more standard Hollywood conventions. Linklater and Smith both made movies about nothing, essentially films with little to no plot outside of conversations. This suburban take on realism would only continue to be influential with the rise of mumblecore in the mid-2000s. Low-budget films that focused on dialogue and personal relationships over any real plot. However, it wasn't until the late 2000s that a wave of films started emerging that incorporated all of these influences in a way that I think would be the most accurate to bear the American neorealism label. This is where Sean Baker's films like Tangerine and The Florida Project come in. While they are undoubtedly directly influenced by neorealism, and The Florida Project might very well be the greatest film to come out of this movement, Sean isn't the first or most acclaimed filmmaker to bring about this style. Take Derek Sion France's 2010 film Blue Valentine, for example. It features a naturalistic visual style and a focus on the intimate and personal experiences of these working class characters. It's probably the most accurate depiction of a bad marriage on film. However, unlike traditional neo-realist films, it stars Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams, two Academy Award nominated actors. Or take Jeff Nichols' film Shotgun Stories, Take Shelter, and Mud, all of which share a naturalistic visual style, use of non-professional actors, and focus on issues such as poverty, neglect, and family dysfunction within working class families. These films' explorations of complex human emotions and relationships set them apart from traditional neo-realist focuses, such as overarching social issues or political commentary, and all of which star Michael Shannon, with the latest also starring Matthew McConaughey. But The Florida Project is a little more stylistic, focuses on relationships, and stars William Dafoe, a two-time Academy-nominated actor. So if we're describing these films as American neorealism, which I do agree is the best way to describe them, we have to define what that is. A fusion of neorealistic approaches to more traditional Hollywood conventions. Stories that often focus on poverty or marginalized groups within American society, with non-professional actors and a naturalistic visual style that emphasizes the lives of ordinary people. Or as American film critic Jay Haberman put it, a voice to the voiceless, the poor, the dispossessed, the unemployed, peasants, children, and ordinary people subjugated by circumstances, political or social, they could not control. I think this is an all-encompassing view of the genre, where films like Linklater's 2014 Boyhood can be seen fitting that label even though it's the life and upbringing of a middle-class white kid. Where films like American Honey, Moonlight, Good Time, and Nomadland can wear this label even though they feature some of the most famous actors of our time and have major production companies backing them. Where films about robbing banks seem realistic because at the end of the day, they are realistic. While the 90s indie wave was mulling in suburban boredom, 2010's American neorealism had the 08 financial crisis. And when 38% of Americans find it difficult to afford usual household expenses, 64% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, and 8 out of 10 Americans in debt, it's no wonder why these films are becoming so popular. Because much like the citizens of Rome in 1945, people aren't just looking for something they can relate to but something they can escape to. By portraying both the realism of the working class and the inherent need for escapism that comes with it, these filmmakers have not only made neorealism more accessible to the broader audience, but transformed it while doing so. It's a unique set of films that is ever expanding, and with films in this genre increasingly getting more attention and acclaim, I think the style has a bright future. Many of us can relate to these characters in ways even the actors portraying them can't, and still come out of the movie feeling positive. American neorealism is my favorite film genre, but thanks to Walt Disney and Ronald Reagan, we're just getting to know what it is. I don't exclusively talk about film, but if you're interested, I have a video on how the most notorious film pirate got caught and got away, and how Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ influenced Kendrick Lamar's last album, both of which you can find on the screen now.